Welcome everyone to this first lecture in financial risk management. As you probably have seen on the slides and on the course announcements, uh, my name is Gregor Weiss. I'm the chair in banking and finance here at our faculty. Um, and as every, as in every summer semester, I will be teaching financial risk management here. Um, you might already have seen some of the slides. I will tell you in a bit uh, where you can find the slides, uh, I've sent around the password for the slides via AlmaWeb. Maybe that's the first thing I should ask you. Um, is everyone registered on AlmaWeb? Is anyone not registered on AlmaWeb? Okay. Uh, maybe you can come to me at the end uh, of the class and I will tell you what we can do with you uh, in order to give you all the information I might be sending around uh, via AlmaWeb. Um, <clears throat> Maybe a disclaimer is also in place. Uh, as you have noticed, I will be recording uh, all of my lectures and I will only record the slides in my own voice and uh, the sounds I'll be making. Um, and as long as you do not jump in front uh, of the class and start screaming into the microphone, none of your personal rights uh, or your privacy uh, are infringed here. I'm just telling you that because I once had a student who complained a little bit uh, that uh, I might be uh, violating his privacy rights, um, but he didn't realize that I was not using a camera. So, well, his problem. Okay. Um, the class is called Financial Risk Management. Um, I will talk about uh, the organization and outline of the class in just a bit, but here on this slide you can see what we will be dealing with um, in financial risk management. Uh, first of all, We'll start with a small theoretical um, discussion of what risk, what financial risk management is, and why risk management um, and why firms engage in risk management. Because the, empirically, we can observe that not only financial institutions but also industrial companies engage a lot in risk management, uh, in technical risk management, but also in financial risk management. The theoretical idea then is why do firms engage in risk management because risk management will cost you money and hopefully you will save on cost at some other point and you will prevent losses but it needs to be there needs to be a reason why for example the bank or an insurance company will engage in financial risk management and the shoe shop will not so this is what we'll talk about in this first part on the necessity of managing financial risk. Then we'll discuss different types of risk. My favorite example is operational risk. That's the risk that, for example, this beamer falls down and hits one of you. That's operational risk. That's a danger that arises from the company, or in this case, the university running an operation. It could also be that we lose money from a loan, we lose money by stock prices going down or by going up, and we have different types of financial risk in any company, and we need to manage these financial risks. So that's the second part. We then uh, identify the sources of risk. We try to measure risk. We can use different metrics, different measures. Um, if, for example, we have this danger of the beamer, uh, the projector falling down, we will have a probability that this occurs, maybe one in a million, and we'll have a financial loss, a potential loss. The student, you're probably the only one in danger here. You might sue the university or you might want to sue me. And then what is your maximal damage, uh, your maximum loss? Then we have two different metrics for this potential danger. Mm, very strange example, we'll get better ones. Then back testing and stress testing. Uh, we will model financial risk. And if we have models, we need to check the accuracy of these models. And that's what usually you refer to as back testing or stress testing in finance. And risk management, financial risk management couldn't go without a discussion of financial derivatives, especially designed financial instruments that can be used for speculation, but which are heavily used in modern financial markets for risk management and hedging. Derivatives, 
options, swap contracts, forward contracts, future contracts. These are financial contracts that are used for hedging, also Absicherung and Absicherungsgeschäfte. And we'll first talk about the fundamentals of these derivatives, of these hedging instruments, and then discuss different hedging strategies. And that should conclude our discussion here of financial risk management at this level here in the bachelor's class. That's the outline. Uh, I will now talk about some basic admin administrative stuff uh, for this class. As you are probably aware, this is a bachelor's degree class uh, for five ECTS points. Uh, we'll have three hours, two hours lecture each week and one hour online videos that will be uploaded uh, during the semester. It's an optional elective class in the Bachelor in Economics, so no one forces you to take it. Um, if you probably, after one or two weeks, if you think, okay, this is not what I sign up for, um, I don't take any offense of you leaving the class. Uh, if you have friends that now realize, oh, this is actually a great class, you can try to um, talk them into joining, uh, that's no problem. If you haven't registered yet for the class, that's no problem. Uh, the sky's the limit when it comes to our class capacity here. You can register late by downloading a formula from the website of our chair, filling it out and giving it to Mrs. Rosenberg, my secretary. We have a deadline, I think, the end of mid and May. Just look up the website uh, on the faculty. Um, and this is also where you will find the formula, uh, the form, not the formula. As an assessment, we have a written exam for everyone in a degree program. Um, so 60 minute written exam. Um, if you are an Erasmus student, do we have Erasmus students here? Yeah, a couple. Uh, you can choose between the 60 minute written exam or a term paper that is also described on the website. There is a deadline. I think it's July 26th uh, and you need to hand in the term paper via email to, again, Mrs. Rosenberg, our, our secretary. Okay. But you can always come to me and ask for uh, instructions on how to write the term paper, what is, what is expected of you in the term paper and uh, what my advice would be if you should take the written exam or the term paper. Okay. Now, if you haven't received the email via Alma Web yet, or if you haven't checked your emails, um, you can go to the course website. Um, and this is my website and teaching. You have, if you go to teaching, you have, uh, first of all, a little ad for my textbook. And you have financial risk management here, uh, some, um, general statements, and the set of slides. Now, one, one, one note is, is, is necessary here. You can download the German set of slides, but the German set of slides is no longer updated. So as we progress over from semesters to semester, the German set of slides will differ more and more from the current set of English slides. This is why I still provide you with the German slides. In this semester, I guess uh, they will match with 99.9%, .9%, but it might be that a couple of slides will be different from the English slides on which the exam will be based. So if you are using the German set of slides, I take no responsibility for the German set of slides being a good preparation for the written exam at this semester. You know? So this is just out of courtesy and as a help for you if you are completely uneasy with English. But the English set of slides, uh, at least the first part, I, I need to go through the slides because there are still so many typos and grammar uh, errors. Um, I will go, be going through the set of slides throughout the semester and upload part by part. Um, you can download previous exams here, and I guess that's the best preparation for the final exam. We should have five, six, seven previous exams from the last four years here. Uh, and then you can um, get, a, get an idea of what the exams will look like. Um, well, the tutorial is just on YouTube. And here's the information for the Erasmus students. Yeah? OK. That should be clear. Um, 
Let's see. Next. Okay. No. You can contact me uh, via email. You can send me an email at vice at vifa.uni-leipzig.de. Um, you can follow me now on Twitter. I'm on Twitter now. Um, I, I realized that some of my colleagues from the econ uh, uh, division are already on, uh, are already ranting on Twitter. Um, economics, just related to economics topics, of course. Um, but uh, some of my colleagues are already on Twitter. Uh, and I want to use Twitter just to retweet interesting uh, news articles, research results from, for example, the European Central Bank, from Deutsche Bundesbank, from the German Institutes on Economic Research, all those, all those policy makers and, and key people of interest in the wider field of economics and finance, they are all on Twitter. So I just think if you are interested a little bit more in finance, risk management and in financial markets, uh, I, I will retweet and send around uh, some, some interesting things on Twitter. Yeah. And I will also spam you with my own research results. That might also happen on Twitter. Yeah. Next, uh, YouTube. By clicking on this uh, huge YouTube logo, uh, you will get to my YouTube channel. And uh, as you might have realized by now, all these lectures are recorded. They will be uploaded to YouTube and you can watch them on YouTube. Um, Unfortunately, not uh, in, in, in nice little bits of like 12 or 30 minutes, but the full, the full Monty of 90 minutes or even longer. Meaning that I, I, never, I never really understand who can watch me and who can listen on YouTube to me for 90 minutes in one session. I mean, if you are sitting here, this is something different, but forcing yourself to listen to a YouTube video for 90 minutes, that's, that's quite strange. Actually, in the YouTube analytics, I can really, I can see the average duration each video is watched, 12 minutes, just like any makeup video, 12 minutes, you know, the magic number on YouTube. So, and more interestingly, the recordings will obviously not be edited as long as there is something really weird or if I have the impression that I have really to cut out something that has never happened before. Um, otherwise, it will be exactly the same audio file and the same set of slides I'm using right here. It might be that, for example, if we are closing in on the end of the semester, uh, you, will, you might want to ask more questions uh, related to the exam. And at the start of each lecture, I will ask you before the recording if you have any questions that you do not want to be recorded. And if one of you asks me a question related to the exam, I will not record this. You know? So that's the deal. If you don't want, if you want to ask a question, you can do so without fearing that someone will hear you uh, on YouTube. Okay. We have two mailing lists. Uh, Banken and Jobsbank Fin. Um, just for this case that someone is not on Alma Web, I would advise you to register at least uh, to the first mailing list because I will send um, information related to this class to the first mailing list and also to Alma Web. So for those students who for, coming from some faculties who do not yet use Alma Web, at least those students should register with the first uh, mailing list. The second one is just for the job postings, because every time a company, a bank or insurance company, say, or a consulting company sends uh, a job posting for an internship, for a training position or for, for a starting position, I will just send it, I will just relay to this um, mailing list. You know? So if you're interested in internships or jobs, just um, use the second link. Now, if you want to speak to me in person, outside of this lecture. If you want to uh, schedule an appointment, you can use this link here to calendly.com. It will redirect you to calendly.com slash Gregor Weiss. And you can choose between uh, a physical visit uh, to my office or a Skype call. So you will have here the office hour and you will have a Skype call. And for example, if you click here, this program is directly synchronized with my Outlook calendar. 
So you will only see those times that are available and I'm free in my office or via Skype. So for example, you could choose the 8th of April and say 11 o'clock, and then you have to enter some data here. I think you can click on uh, confirm. You need to enter your name, your Skype ID, and so on, and then you can schedule a meeting in my office or uh, via Skype. Okay. I hope it's convenient for you. I can only say that it's quite convenient for me as, as, as long as it works. It took me a long time to get it working. Okay. So that's Calendly. Uh, then now let's turn to textbooks. Risk management. There is an abundance of textbooks available on the topic of financial risk management. The first one is quite famous. It's by John C. Hull from the University of Toronto. This is the German version. All books, all textbooks are also available in English. And then it's not called Risiko Management, Banks, Versich Banken, Versicherungen and, and andere Finanzinstitutionen. It's just called Risk Management, Banks, Insurances and Other Financial Institutions. Same title, same author. Um, so the, the Hull textbook on risk management is a, is a, is a favorite. Um, this one's a great textbook but I guess only of interest to students of math, uh, econometrics, math, physics, and so on. Are there any students who are studying mathematics, econometrics? Yeah, okay, a couple of you. So this, is, this should be the textbook of choice if you're interested in risk management beyond those things that we'll be discussing here. Um, unfortunately for you, one of the co-authors, Rüdiger Frey, used to be a professor of financial mathematics here at Leipzig. He's now at Vienna University. But this is a great textbook. It's the absolute standard textbook on quantitative risk management, but it also requires a little bit more background in mathematics and statistics. But I use some parts of it here, uh, not really much. Um, there is also a large section in this uh, all-time favorite uh, classic German textbook on banking, Bankbetriebslehre by Hartmann Wendels, Pfingsten Weber. Uh, those used to be the the uh, the traditional, how should I put it, the traditional top universities and top schools in business in Germany, Münster, Münster, Cologne and Mannheim, well that ch has changed a little bit, uh, but this is why this is the, I guess, the most favorite and most m best known textbook on banking that is in German. That is not saying that it's the best on the market, but if you want to read a little bit uh, on risk management in banking, you can look at the uh, part of this textbook, Bankbetriebslehre. Then, this is, I guess, uh, in addition to the risk management textbook by Hull, the second basic textbooks you might want to look at, options, futures, and other derivatives. Um, this is, I guess, the most famous textbook on financial derivatives there is. Also, usually just referred to as the Hull. You can look it up in Hull, in the Hull textbook, uh, and usually refer to it as this is one, no? the option. Options, futures, and other derivatives. And both available in English and in German. Same thing. You do not need a textbook. As you can see, I'm planning on giving you almost 600 slides. So we'll be working like 40 to 50 slides per week. Uh, so everything you need to know and everything I do here in this class is almost fully written down on the slides. You only need the textbooks if you want to read a little bit more or if you think that um, you can, um, if, you, if you need to hear these things in, in another way and from another world. Um, if you want to read up on all of this in German, well, it had to come at some point, please buy my textbook. There is a, I, we have written this textbook on, on, it's called Unternehmerische Finanzpolitik, but it's a finance textbook. It should cover all basic elements of finance uh, at the bachelor's level. Uh, Paul Horsch, Kalthofen, Ude Weiss. Um, um, and the part on risk management was written by me. And as you will see, it's just a, a more spelled out version of this lecture. So the risk management part here in this textbook in German is the German spelled out version of this lecture. Okay. 
But unfortunately, I also provided our university with, I think, 20 copies. So the chances of you buying this textbook and the chance for me to getting my euro per copy are quite slim. So um, don't write textbooks. It's not worth the effort. Yeah, you will not get you will not get rich unless you write the whole textbook. Yeah, it's it's always always nice at the end of a year when you see okay fifty people bought your textbook and you are getting forty nine euros or something out of that. <laughs> there. A, a year well spent, I just say. Yeah, it took it took me almost a year to write that. Okay, um, what do I intend to do with you in this class? Give you an introduction to financial risk management. As you've probably seen, we also have lectures on derivatives uh, held by Professor Schumacher. Has any one of you taken the class on derivatives or has already taken or is taking it right now? Derivatives, Professor Schumacher, just a couple of you, okay. So there are there is a large intersection between his class and my class. The difference is I'm focusing, he's focusing exclusively on derivatives. I'm focusing on risk management, and I also have to discuss derivatives in more detail in, I would say, one third of my lecture. But I have a stronger focus on risk management as a whole and on banks and financial institutions. Okay. Financial institutions, and this is also part of banking. Why? Well, banks are those companies and are the companies that use financial risk management the most in combination with insurance companies. <laughs> the shoe shop doesn't really need risk management, financial risk management. A bank, yes. Insurance, yes. The EEX, yes. Energy companies, yes. Daimler, BMW, yes. Below that, well, it depends. So this is why we have a strong focus on banking, but not exclusively on banking. Also on insurance, financial institutions, and at some points, uh, energy companies and utilities companies. Well, yes, and we will discuss why do you need risk management? What is risk management? What is risk? Quite philosophical. And what is regulation concerning risk management? And how can you manage, measure uh, risk? And what should be your end game? Any question concerning the course organization and outline? And remember, you might be recorded. Otherwise, you will have to come to me after the class. No question. OK, I, I, I hope I've covered all bases when it comes to the course organization. You should know where you can get the material, where you can download the exams, uh, or the previous ones, and uh, what we'll be talking about here. OK. Then. Let's turn to risk management. What is risk management? I've brought you one example. It's in German, but I can translate you the headline. Uh, CPAs, public accountants, criticize risk management at HSH Nordbank. HSH Nordbank. What is HSH Nordbank? By the way, um, let me just do a quick survey. I guess the Erasmus students, by definition, are not from Germany, right? Uh, are you all from the European Union? Is anyone coming from outside the European Union? Okay, yeah, okay. I, I have to explain a little bit about the German banking sector. In the German banking sector, we have what we call Landesbanken, uh, state banks. Those are banks that are state-owned. They are, they are not uh, public. Uh, they're, no, they're not privately owned, they are state banks, state-owned banks. For example, we used to have one for the state of Saxony, and HSH Bank, Nordbank, Heisha Nordbank, is the state-owned bank owned by the states of Hamburg and Schleswig-Holstein in the very north of Germany. They, they compete with private banks. The only difference is that the state, in this case, two federal states, are the owners of this bank. And as in almost all of these cases where you have a state-owned company, the company is run badly. And it is, uh, it is a, it's an unwritten law in German banking that usually all these state banks have severe deficiencies when it comes to management, 
when it comes to business plan and business model. And this is why the number of state banks has decreased and decreased dramatically after the financial crisis. Our uh, state bank of Saxony had to be bailed out by the state bank of uh, Baden-Württemberg, and it's now just called LBBW, Sachsen Bank, because they also changed the name from Sachsen LB, Sachsen Landesbank. So you know a little bit about uh, Landesbanken and state-owned banks in Germany. And HSH Nordbank was the first and most dramatic example of a state-owned bank that went fully bankrupt during the financial crisis. It exploded. Why? They entered contracts they didn't, they didn't know. They entered financial contracts in mortgage in the mortgage um, securitized mortgage market where they had no clue what they were getting into. And this person here, you can only see his face a little bit here, that was the CEO, Dr. Nonnenbach. His nickname was Dr. No, uh, in, in reference to the first and most famous James Bond villain. His name was Dr. No. Um, they lost a lot of money. Uh, they still exist, and the two states still have problems trying to sell the bank and the, and the remaining assets of the bank. And in this case, after the crisis in 2009, the uh, CPAs and the consultants just uh, put out a report after auditing the company and they just said the risk management was in an appalling state and it's no wonder they imploded during the financial crisis okay so risk management seems to pop up every now and then uh, in real life and this is the case of Haas Hanotbank they suffered losses in the billions just for the same reason any bank lost money in the financial crisis. They bought assets, the assets lost, uh, um, had uh, decreased in value. They had to write uh, off these assets and they had to report losses in billions and billions of euros. And in 2009, the auditors identified a number of violations in the bank's risk management. What did they find? Insufficient monitoring systems. No one really knew what assets they had, what risk exposure they had, and what potential losses might occur. They had incorrect valuation methods. So they had assets, but the methods and models used to price these instruments were incorrect and didn't work properly. And they lost almost 96 million euros due to various weaknesses in the risk management process for capital market transactions. In, the, in one of these extreme examples, they sent money to an already bankrupt company. So they, if they had only opened a newspaper, they would have known we don't need to send money, the company is bankrupt. And they still paid like two or 300 million euros. With a different bank, same scenario, completely, completely inadequate risk management. Yeah? And this happened a lot during the financial crisis, but this was just an example uh, of one of many and during the financial crisis, even we, uh, as right now still students of finance uh, who haven't come in touch with risk management, even, even we were <coughs> seeing these examples of deficiencies in risk management by looking at a newspaper. Because usually risk management, man, risk management is something that, is, uh, that doesn't pop up too many times in the public discussion, in the public discourse. Now, risk management. What what your definition of risk management be and what, what do you think is risk? And this is what I meant with quite a philosophical question. What is risk? How would you define risk? I gave a talk to some practitioners a couple of weeks ago and actually they all immediately came up with a very nice definition of risk. Didn't quite match the one I have, but uh, what is risk? thinking from a, the perspective of a financial manager. You have a company, you have finance streams, you have cash flows coming in and coming out of your company, then what is risk? What, what, how would you define risk? In the most basic way, you can just say, well, any deviation from something you would expect, from, a, from an expected cash flow. If you expect a payment of 100, 
And if you only get 80, then the difference of 20 euros from your expected cash flow, this could be risk. First thing you see and you have to see is it should be stochastic. Everything that is deterministic is no longer a risk. Risk implies stochastic behavior. This is why at some point you will enter the realm of quantitative finance, statistics, statistical analysis, not now, probably not here, but everything needs to be everything needs to be statistic and stochastic in nature. Why? If I were to tell you you have to pay your rent at the end of the month, that is nothing that is risk to you. That is something you need to plan. You need to take this into consideration and this needs to become part of your budgeting plans, but not your risk management. So risk needs to be, well, risky. That's the first thing. Then, here in this lecture, we deal with financial risk. We do not deal with reputational risk, not so much. We do not risk with uh, general strategic risk or business risk. And I, give, I usually give a very simple example. If you open a sausage stand like the one right in front of our building, you, you make a decision that you want to sell sausages. And if no one wants to buy your sausages, you have the risk to, of going bankrupt. But that is not the type of risk you want to deal with in risk management. That is your strategic risk, your basic risk of running a business. If you are running your business and if you have the wrong product, if you have the wrong business model, you will go bankrupt, but that's not part of risk management. The risk management, the financial risk, even the sausage uh, barbecue guy here, the, the financial risk he faces is what would happen if the price for sausages goes up by 10% and I can only charge the same price. If my input factors increase in price, I will have what is later referred to commodity risk. It's probably a bad example with a sausage produ uh, producer, but imagine Daimler, imagine BMW. They will have to buy a lot of steel, aluminum, and so on. And if market prices for aluminum and steel vary and increase or decrease, they will have risk exposure. That's financial risk, and that's the type of risk we are facing and discussing here. If you have the if you don't have a good business idea, don't blame it on risk management. If you are selling the wrong type of sausage, not my problem. Yeah? So that's risk. And it gets more philosophical from that. We'll see that in a minute. But then, what is risk management? What is risk management if this is risk? A stochastic deviation from an expected cash flow, more or less. What is risk management? Just like in any, any field of business, yada yada management always means what? Innovation management, HR management, strategic management, risk management. What is management? Identification of a problem, thinking of possible solutions to the problem, solving the problem, performing an action, and checking whether the action you have taken had the desired effect. Same in innovation management, same in HR management. What is your problem? You need personnel. What do you do? You can hire this person, you can hire that person. You need to find a salary. You do it, you hire this person. And later on you decide, have I hired the right person? And then it goes on and on for this. In risk management, what is risk management? It's the process of identifying risk, measuring risk, doing something again against risk, managing risk, and checking whether the measures you've taken performed well or not. That's risk management. So let's see this on the slide. Financial losses as risk. Now, this is the part where it gets philosophical. Usually, we will only be concerned about losses, potential losses. I thought I would get 100 euros. I might lose 20. Even if I could earn 120, so if I have um, a surplus and an increase of 20 euros, I usually care about the just about the financial losses. Why? Because 
I want to make sure that I don't go out of business, that I go, don't face bankruptcy. This is what I am most concerned about in risk management. However, I will shortly give you two examples where positive deviations also indicate risk or a risky situation. But let's start with financial losses. We need uncertainty about the likelihood that something will or will not happen. For example, the deviation of a parameter or an expected cash flow from an expected target value. And usually here we'll have random negative deviations of financial variables, prices, uh, market values, um, volumes, etc., from previously defined reference values. So that's, that's what we define as risk. So we need randomness, stochastic behavior, usually negative deviations, losses, it should be financial. Um, that is in contrast, say, to, for example, reputational risk. Um, well, a bad reputation is bad for you, but a bad reputation will also result in what? A bad reputation, let's take a very vivid example. Let's take the tobacco industry. Totally bad reputation. Does it hurt the company financially? Unfortunately, no. So reputation risk, yes. Financial impact, zero. So why should you care about this type of risk management as long as there is no direct impact on the business, on your financing? Different example, Volkswagen diesel scandal direct impact on the financing situation of the company yes indeed so reputational risk translates into financial losses via a slower or smaller car sales so then yes this is a type of risk but then you can also directly model the financial losses and you don't care about the increase or decrease in some kind of reputation proxy or reputation metric hmm? so in the one could, it, one could put it more dramatically. In the end, it, it, comes always, it always comes down to a dollar or a euro. If it can be measured in dollars or euros in a monetary unit, why care at all? We are, we are in the business of increasing shareholder value and generating a profit for the company and the shareholders. So why care about anything other than profits and shareholder value as long as it has an impact on the financial situation of the company. Very capitalistic view, I have to agree to that, but again, um, everything else will also impact the company at one point or the other. Yep. Companies will care about reputation and so on, and also about other stakeholders, but it should all be reflected in shareholder value in the end. And ideally, risk should be measurable. If I tell you um, I have a financial position, if I have an investment and I can lose 20% on my investment, I can measure this loss. How can you measure, in contrast, a decrease in reputation? How can you rate? How can you uh, measure reputation? That's quite difficult. So that's why usually you should stick to something that can be measured ideally in euros or dollars, or at least in percent. Okay. So that's what usually we'll think of as risk. Now, I told you that usually we'll talk about financial losses and negative deviations. And I have two counter examples that only show that you should think about positive risks as well. Why? First example, this is uh, at this point, um, I realized that by now I'm, I'm a little bit older than you are because I think no one remembers the case of Barings Bank. This happened during my childhood in the 90s. Uh, and Barings Bank was a, a huge uh, public uh, case in the newspapers. Uh, what happened? Barings Bank uh, was, a f was a famous investment bank in the UK. And from one day to the other, it went bankrupt with a loss of $1.4 billion. No one expected this. What had happened? The classic case of a rogue trader, meaning that one person, in this case a guy called Nick Leeson, uh, did what every, every good 
rogue trader does. You keep two separate accounts, uh, one for your profits and one for, for your losses. The account for your losses you hide from your bosses, even rhymes, and you only report the account on which you have booked your profits to your boss. And same here, because this guy, Nick Leeson, reported profit after profit after profit, he got promoted to, I think, chief derivatives trader in the Singapore branch of Barings Bank. He continued to do this and did this for quite some time. And at some point, something happened. Um, he had accumulated almost $1.4 billion in losses. The bank didn't realize that it had such high losses and something happened. Um, the uh, Great Hanshin earthquake in Japan happened uh, in the mid-90s. And again, you probably don't remember this. Uh, it was before Fukushima was the largest, one of the largest earthquakes in Japan. And it uh, demolished large, large parts of Kobe uh, in the Hanshin uh, area. Hanshin is uh, Kobe, Osaka. Um, and in that area, you, I think almost 3,000 people died uh, because of the fires that broke out afterwards. And there were some famous pictures and uh, uh, news shows and videos where you could see the, um, the highways collapsing and the highways falling to the side because of the earthquake. Um, and after that crisis and after the earthquake, all the Asian markets went down. And at that point, because all markets were going down and going down dramatically, Nick Leeson was no longer able to hide these enormous losses. What did he do? Packed his bag, fled the country, and he was arrested at Frankfurt Airport by German police and extradited to the UK, where he was sentenced to jail. Later on, got cancer, was released to jail, and now he's running around giving speeches and writing books. Um, same thing with any guy who is... Uh, has done bad things in the financial market. They always, they always end up as motivational speakers. This is the classic case of a rogue trader. And you can see from this example, if the bank had thought about the reasons why this guy only reported profit after profit after profit, and if they had thought about a very basic principle no risk, no fun, and there's not a free lunch in finance and in financial markets. If you want to earn a lot of money, you have to take up a lot of risk. And without risk, no profit, and no profit without risk. So if they had just thought about it one minute, and for one minute about the reasons why this guy was able to earn such high profits, they should have realized that something was off. And every time something is too good to be true, you should just... Think about this in more detail. Uh, okay, now Outlook is completely harm up. Nice. That's the first example. Barings Bank. And the second one is even better. Bernie Madoff. Does anyone know the case of Bernie Madoff? Ever heard of this guy? Greatest, greatest uh, uh, Ponzi scheme operator uh, in the history of the US and probably the world. I guess I first have explained what a Ponzi scheme is. Ponzi scheme, named after uh, the person who first did this in the US, uh, some Italian-American guy with a last name Ponzi. Uh, Ponzi. Um, a Ponzi scheme is what we call in German Schneeballsystem. But there is a small difference between German and English here. In German, we know legal and illegal Ponzi schemes. For example, insurance companies often run a legal Ponzi scheme, meaning that I'm trying to sell insurance contracts uh, and uh, I will sell insurance contracts. And if I've sold enough insurance contracts, I will get some subordinates like, for example, you three, and then you will sell insurance contracts. And for each contract you sell, you will have to pay 20% to me and I will be supervising you. And then if I, we four sell enough insurance contracts, I get promoted and then I will be the head of office and the head of section and so on. That's what is called Strukturvertrieb in German, in insurance. Uh, meaning that it's, it's, a, it's a kind of Ponzi scheme where you have a lot of people at the lowest level, they're trying to sell something and they have to pay um, 
uh, royalty fees to the persons higher up in the um, in the hierarchy. And obviously, the one sitting at the top is earning a lot of money from all those little um, all those little uh, people at the lower levels set, running around and selling contracts. That is illegal, at least in Germany, with insurance uh, companies in in a special way. In English. When you hear the word Ponzi scheme, it is always meant to be illegal. Yeah? And that is an illegal Ponzi scheme. What did Bernie Madoff do? Bernie Madoff uh, had uh, an investment fund. And how, how does an investment fund usually work? I open a fund. You are my investors. I will ask you for your investments. You will buy uh, shares in my fund. I will invest those funds. And if I'm a good investor, I will earn a profit and then I will be able to pay out, let's say, a 5 or 6% uh, return on your investments. And I will keep a fee of, say, 0.5, 0.7% on, on the dollar. That's how usually an investment fund will work. Bernie Madoff did the following. He had, let's say, the first three investors. You paid each paid a million into my fund. By the way, many Hollywood actors and uh, uh, stars and pension funds. You three pay three million to me as Bernie Madoff. I will take these three millions and I will suddenly say I earned 15% return on your investment. How will I pay out the 15% return on your investments? I will wait. I will tell those guys in front of you, uh, or in the back. I will tell you I have an investment fund. I'm guaranteeing 15% return on your investment. Then I will get eight or nine millions from the next uh, set of investors, and I will pay the return on your investment by taking the money just out of uh, the nine millions I've just taken into my investment fund from the next set of investors. And this is how the snowball gets larger and larger. And in the end, nothing was invested. And with nothing, we are speaking of $65 billion. And again, during the financial crisis, he was no longer able to meet these return payments. Why? Because no one was no longer willing to invest in his fund. He's serving a lifetime jail sentence in the US. I think his son committed suicide. And that's Bernie Madoff. 65 million US dollars. And a statement of a whistleblower should have tipped off everyone. The biggest tip off of a fraud was that Madoff reported his fund was down only three months out of 87, whereas the S&P 500 was down 28 months during the same period. Again, too good to be true. If it's fishy, if it smells fishy, it's probably a fraud, right? So this is this is also a counter example to uh, the general rule that we only care about financial losses and negative deviations. If it's a profit, if it's if it's a high increase in value, well, if it's fishy, it's probably not correct. Yeah. Then how should we measure? How can we measure financial risk? This is an extract from Thomson Reuters Financial Data Stream, a professional vendor of data, financial data, and I've taken this uh, from the for the S and P 500. This is just a plot of the index value of the S&P 500 compo composite index. Well, the index goes up, goes down, and here we can see the absolute values. How should we measure risk? Next best thing what we could do is we could take the so-called VIX, the volatility index on the S&P 500. Does everyone know what volatility is? In German, Volatilität, Standardabweichung, or squared, it's the variance of random. <coughs> Everyone knows what volatility is? Okay. Now, if you want to invest in the volatility of the S&P 500, you can buy the volatility index on the S&P 500. That's the so-called VIX, V-I-X. The VIX obviously shows whether the... Um, the S&P 500 is more or less volatile at certain times. So it's more volatile. You could use the VIX as an indicator of risk. And what can you see from this index? <laughs> 
What is striking about the volatility index of the S&P 500? Any idea? Well, here, obviously, what is this? In 2001, most likely, it's September 11th. Well, that's, that's the spike in the volatility of markets right after markets reopened after September 11 or before they were closed. And what is this? It's also quite quite clear what day this was. No one? What happened here? Even if you if you cannot see it what happened between 2007 and 2009, this day, it's Lehman Brothers. Yeah? This is where markets went down uh, after the fall of Lehman Brothers, and this is where the volatility of the S&P 500 skyrocketed. Yeah? So by just looking at the volatility of the S&P 500, you can immediately see market phases uh, that were highly volatile. But still, what does it tell you? Well markets were more or less volatile that's an indication of risk but it really doesn't tell you if you are if you are close to losing 100 euros or 150 euros okay so we can use the data of the s p 500 if we calculate uh the lock changes the lock returns on the daily lock returns on the s p 500 we'll get a plot like this again you can see the relatively um, calm period between 2002 and 2007. Nothing really happened between September 11 and the crisis. You can see immediately see the highly volatile phase during the financial crisis. And this is probably something you are not really aware of. At 98 to 2001, this is what is usually referred to as the LTCM and the Asian market crisis. Yeah, at, the, at the end of the 90s, Russia defaulted, Asian markets went down, and uh, a large hedge fund, uh, long-term capital management, LTCM, uh, also went out of business and had to be bailed out. And the LTCM crisis, back in the days before the financial crisis, the LTCM crisis and the Asian crisis at the end of the 90s were thought to be a big crisis. Well, along came the financial crisis, and after that, no one really cared about the minuscule uh, LTCM crisis. But at that time, this is LTCM, Asian crisis, and also not just uh, September 11, but also the burst of the dot-com bubble. Um, at the end of the 90s, uh, the dot-com bubble burst, and this is also can also be seen in the volatility here of the lock returns. Okay. Now we can take the absolute returns and see what um, absolute returns we had here on these days. Um, we can also take the volatility. That's pretty much the VIX. And we can also take the log returns below the 5% quantile. Uh, can anyone explain what a quantile is? German quantile. Quantile is a point, a random variable, so that, let's say, this here could be the 7% quantile. Meaning that you have 7% probability here and 93% here. And if you take the 5% quantile, that would mean this is here. And in this plot, I simply took those log returns that are below the 5% quantile of all those log returns. Meaning that this here on uh, on the day Lehman Brothers collapsed, this index, the S&P 500, lost 10% on just one day. And this is enormous if you consider the fact that the S&P 500 includes 500 very distinctive uh, companies. 
That is, some of the large banks lost 20, 30 percent on just one day, and billions and billions in market capitalization were were just were just destroyed on what on that day. Hmm? So those are the log returns below the five percent quantile, and you can see, okay, those are the most dramatic losses the S and P 500 suffered during these uh, 20 years. So it could be that this is an indication and this is a way to measure risk. Just look at those losses that are extreme in nature, extreme losses, one idea. We can do the same with the 10% quantile. Well, those are the losses that are less extreme. They are still uh, very uh, seldom, but they are less extreme. They happen every, let's say, Every, every, every tenth day, you know, one out of ten. Okay. Same above, uh, lock returns above the 90% quantile or the 95% quantile. Actually, the same picture here, you can just see that the most extreme profits now remain in the plot and the ones uh, between uh, five and ten percent quantile; those are eliminated. Okay. So these are just one or two ideas how you could measure risk, and we'll later on see more sophisticated measures that are actually used in practice and that are also accepted by financial regulators. Because financial regulators will ask banks and insurance companies to use certain risk metrics um, as part of their reporting. Okay, now what is risk management? Risk management, as I said, is the whole set of um, measures for the systematic identification, measurement, management, and control of risks in any given company. What is the primary goal of risk management? This is, this is a beauty. Um, if you ask someone, on the street, what would you think risk management should do? Then these people will start ranting about reducing risks, making sure the company doesn't default, making sure no one's hurt. Uh, in financial risk management, in the end, it's just shareholder value stabilization or maximization. If I say you don't lose money, shareholder value. You don't want to go bankrupt, shareholder value. You don't want to end up with too high losses, shareholder value, profits, losses. Everything in the end will turn out to have an impact on shareholder value, meaning that risk management can only has as its primary goal the stabilization or ideally the maximization of shareholder value. If it doesn't increase the shareholder value, then don't do it. No? That's quite simple. One should say the expected shareholder value. Risk management is a continuous process. Just like any management, you don't do it once, like for example, choosing your legal form for your business, um, but you have to do it continuously. Identify new risk, measure it, do something against it, manage risk, control it. Uh, do you have an example for a risk category, a risk type that has only recently evolved? Something that is really absolutely new to all companies. Yeah? Automation. Automation, why? What, what is the risk of automation? Going out of business. Going out of business? Yeah. Strategic risk. Something that's, that's something with which you cannot earn money, but that could be a risk to your company. The other trend in in modern eco economies right now, cyber risk. A couple of years ago, no one in companies cared about uh, denial of service attacks, hacks, attacks uh, on the uh, company's IT infrastructure. But nowadays, these attacks increase in number, and companies start uh, to care about cyber risk issues. And um, on the other hand, insurance companies are trying to insure cyber risk, obviously. So this is a risk category that has only come into place a couple of years ago, so for a couple of years now. 
So cyber risk is a new risk. And if you were to do risk management just once at the start of your business, you would lose perspective and you would not see these new risk types. So you do, you do need to do it continuously, always, every time. It's a central management task. You cannot delegate risk management like a call center. So, um, Let's see. Um, so, yeah, you, it's a central management task and it is usually uh, in a company's organization linked to the CEO and to the board of directors. It's not done, uh, at least in most companies, it's not done uh, in the operations part of the business, but it's a central management task. It usually is not delegated, and I cannot think of an example where you can delegate risk management. Uh, what you will do is you will get outside help from consultants, yes. But uh, if you need risk management, you will have your own, um, your own people working on it. Okay. And, yeah, it cannot be delegated. So what is the risk management process? You need to think about risk identification, which risk do you have. In many cases, you know what risk you have. For example, what financial risk does this shoe store have? Think about some risk. Although it's late in the evening, I'm trying to get you a little bit more active. What financial risk does this shoe store company face? Does it give out loans? No. Does it give credit? No. If you want to buy a pair of shoes, you have to pay directly. So there's no credit risk, usually. What could happen else? Someone steals a pair of shoes. You will, might need shop security. Okay. They handle a large amount of cash. So they might want to care about cash management and risk management related to theft. Uh, and they might have the risk that uh, you have a fire in, in a store. Again, we will later see that we have few large risk categories. Credit risk is one category. But we also have operational risk. And this is the only type of risk I think they will face, the shoe store. Uh, the shoe store. Just like the projector falling down on you, this is usually referred to operational risk. The projector falling down and hitting someone. Um, and do you know of any other operational risk here in this room? And I can tell you the university has operational risk management. Okay. Let's try to find the risk in the room. You're looking at the email. Well, okay, this is... Hmm. Let me just see. I can see it here in the back of the room. No, look at the ceiling. The ceiling. The fire sensor. Obviously, we have the risk of a fire breaking out and people and uh, equipment getting in, uh, injured and damaged. And this is a good example of the whole process of risk management. We need to think about what risk do we have. A fire could break out. Can we have flooding here? Well, no, not here. At my university where I studied at Passau, uh, Passau University is right on the on the shore of uh, the River Inn, and it frequently gets flooded. Quite funnily uh, and quite interestingly, uh, they store the old exams in the cellars, and they frequently get flooded. So you don't have to care about your exams being available after, let's say, five or six years, because then they they will have uh, yeah they will have rotted away in the cellar because of uh, the flooding. So flooding could be a problem. Not here, fire, uh, things falling down, um, that's operational risk. Now we've identified the risk. We need to measure the risk. What could happen? Well, if this fire breaks out here and we don't take any measures against the fire, well, the university can burn down and will have a loss of probably a couple of billion euros. Large, high risk, very improbable. Uh, and very low probability of a fire breaking out, but still possible. And if it happens, 
a huge loss, huge financial loss. And it's also financial loss to the state. Then we need to manage risk. Management means um, to prevent it, to eliminate it, to transfer the risk, and so on. And can you think of countermeasures against fire here? What can you do to counter the risk of a fire breaking out as part of risk management? Can you transfer the risk to any other market participant? Insurance company. That's risk transfer, right. That's not very nice if you just do risk transfer, because then I would just tell you, well, the university is accepting the risk that you burn down and that you burn to your death, but at least we are insured. Yeah, that's, that's, that's not a nice approach to risk management when it comes to fire. But again, it, it is a possibility, because then, in this case, the university would face no financial risk apart from any legal statutes in place that require us to do something else. Risk transfer. Next thing could be risk elimination. To eliminate fire risk is, in this case, I think quite difficult. Why and how should we be able to eliminate a risk of fire breaking out unless we always keep our walls and, and floors wet. Yeah? If, we, if we cover everything in, uh, in, in, let's say, water or something else, there will always be the possibility of a fire breaking out. We can eliminate some risks later on. Yeah? If, you, if you buy a derivative and you have a financial loss risk, well, don't buy the derivative. Don't buy a stock. Don't buy into the S&P 500. Then you can eliminate the risk. What else can we do? We can decrease the risk. How? By installing a fire sensor. We are decreasing the risk of financial losses by making sure that even if a fire breaks out, it will not consume the whole university, but firefighters will be notified immediately it might just be a small fire. So we have different, op different possibilities to measure risk and to manage risk here. And this is then risk management. And then we also have to control risk on to make sure that we've taken the right countermeasures. Installing 20 of these sensors will not be economical. That would mean we are spending a lot of money even though we only need one fire sensor. So I'm pretty sure that some engineer figured out that this is the best spot to put the fire sensor at so that we don't need to. So we are controlling our measures. We are making sure that we've taken the best measures against the fire. And obviously, if a fire breaks out, you need to make sure that you identify the reasons why did this happen? Yeah? What did we do wrong that still a fire was able to break out? And this is not as trivial as it might seem. Remember Fukushima. Uh, everyone knows about earthquakes in Japan. But no one thought about the possibility that the earthquake would not happen on land, but a couple of miles outside on the, uh, in the deep sea. And so the, any nuclear power plant in Japan is earthquake-proof, but it wasn't tsunami-proof. So um, just thinking about these types of risk uh, and controlling your risk management um, can improve on these situations. And then especially with financial institutions, you need to communicate your results and you need to report on your risk management. Shareholders, stakeholders, regulators, policymakers need to be informed of what have you done, what, have you, what measures have you taken against risk, and how well is your risk management performing. We'll later on see some of these risk reports from banks because banks are required to do this and they are forced by a financial regulation to publish these risk management reports. The shoe store, even if it does risk management, it does not need to report on risk management. But if you want to see how this communication and this risk management works, uh, you can just look up the risk reports of banks, insurance companies, and even insurance uh, energy companies. Okay. Risk identification. We distinguish and differentiate between internal and external risks. Internal is something that can evolve and 
uh, happen from inside the company. An own employee that does something wrong or an employee that steals from the company, that's a classical internal risk. Sometimes we also have external risk, or actually most of the time we have external risk. A price changes, a market goes down, a company, a business partner goes bankrupt. Something happens, we don't have an influence over this, and the external risk leads to a financial loss at our company. We need to define those risks that are significant and those risks that we do not need to care about. It might be that we have the risk of an asteroid coming down on our university, but we will not install anti-asteroid missiles on the roof of our university. It's not significant. We have a fire risk, yes. Flood risk, no. So distinguish between those risks that are really significant and needs to be, need to be managed and those that are so highly uh, improbable that you don't need to care about. Some risks are already known beforehand. Some others, just like the tsunami risk with Fukushima, they were not directly <laughs> and known to everyone involved. Hmm? Risk management, measure the risk. Ideally, put a price tag to each risk. Beamer comes down, hits no one, well, it's probably worth one or two thousand euros, so financial loss, maximum loss, two thousand euros. In some cases, this is quite simple. Um, for example, I guess most of you have your own flat and then you probably have electricity. I assume that's a given. The electricity company has the risk that you cannot pay your electricity bill. Do you, I hopefully no one has ever experienced this, but what happens if you don't pay your electricity bill? Well, after three months of not paying your electricity bill, electricity will be shut off and you will be sitting in a dark room. So the electricity company has a credit risk it, has, it faces the risk that you do not pay your bill. Unfortunately for the electricity company, electricity cannot be stored. It will be tr transported to your flat. You will use it and no one can squeeze the electricity out of your Nintendo Switch or your computer again so that the company can get it back. It's used and you owe the company the electricity <coughs> bill. So that's a credit risk for the electricity company. And what can the electricity company now do? It's very simple. In their retail portfolio of retail customers, your retail customer. You know the difference? Wholesale, retail, retail, Endkunde, Verbraucher, wholesale, Großhandel. So your retail customers to a bank and to an energy company. And in the retail portfolio, the energy company has a simple, simple calculation. What do you pay for your electricity bill on average, say 50 euros per month? So each and every one of you is a credit risk of say 150 euros for your electricity company. They will just assume that on average you are a risk of 150 euros for them. Quite simple. On average it works. Sometimes it's not as easy as that. So you need more elaborate models from quantitative risk management. And sometimes, well, um, measurement is quite difficult. What can you do now? Uh, you use methods from qualitative risk management, meaning, for example, here with fire, flooding, beamer coming down, you can get someone from operations, you can get an engineer, and you will do an expert interview. You will do an expert survey. You will just ask around, what can you think about? What is your expert judgment? What risks could I be facing in this room? Well, an engineer would probably look at this room and say, well, there's not much that can happen here, apart from well, the ceiling coming down. Okay. Do you need to measure it? No, but just by an engineer coming in here or a fire expert and saying, well, this is glass, um, I would guess that this is a fireproof uh, wall. Nothing's burnable really inside. You can have a look at the construction plans and then he would probably say, well, 
there's nothing that can really burn down here apart maybe from the floor I don't know so one fire sensor is enough there is no measurement and no measurement needed for risk management you only need to know yes you have a slight fire risk and you can do this or that against it and you're done you don't need to measure 150 200 euros etc then risk management risk avoidance don't do it risk reduction install well it's not a, a fire sensor is a kind of fire uh, risk reduction what would even be a better method to reduce the risk of a fire A sprinkler system making sure that if the fire breaks out it's it, it immediately is it extinguished if you have a water sprinkler system here I don't think we have one here we have one in the floor I think um, in the hall then this is also risk reduction risk transfer to an insurance company and risk mitigation in some cases especially in trading by setting limits if there had been limits, for example, for this rogue trader, if they have told him, if they had told him, you're only allowed to trade up to a volume of, say, 50 million, he couldn't have piled up a big loss of 1.4 billion dollars. So limit systems are a good way of limiting and mitigating risk. You are still willing to accept risk, but only to a certain point, and especially in financial trading this is what you do you want risk but only to a certain extent and then you have to mitigate risk that you're willing to take that's risk management very basically you need to back test and to control risk make sure that your risk measurement is ac accurate that you have taken the correct steps against risk and you have to check and recheck your measures and if the benefits justify the costs and then communicate the results internally and externally to the board of directors to the board of supervisors to regulators actuaries and so on in German obviously Vorstand Aufsichtsrat Aufsicht I think we've talked um, a lot now about financial regulation or I've mentioned financial regulation a lot by now is everyone clear who is meant by financial regulation in Germany probably some of you not who is, who is the financial regulator in Germany the financial supervisor the supervising authority for the financial market that's banks insurance and stock markets let's just assume for a moment that the financial market is made up of these three large sections we also have hedge funds and investment managers but that's okay who supervises banks in Germany Deutsche Bundesbank as the central bank in cooperation with as in any country of the European Union the European Central Bank and just like with insurance companies and stock markets and so on BaFin the Bundesanstalt für Finanzdienstleistungsaufsicht the German Federal Office for Financial Market Supervision BaFin Bundesanstalt für Finanzdienstleistungsaufsicht BaFin is responsible for stock markets stock trading funds hedge funds investment managers etc insurance and pension funds and companies and banks European Central Bank and Bundesbank are just responsible for banks in cooperation with BaFin so we have a, a little bit more complex system of financial supervision here and banks need to report on their risk management to ECB 
Bundesbank and Buffen. Okay. This is the risk management process, measurement, identification, Steuerung uh, in German, measure, management, and controlling and communication. Yeah, so it's the risk management process, the risk management cycle. Okay. Now, at the end, I want to talk a little bit about why, theoretically, risk management is relevant or irrelevant. This is very theoretical. And this is where, where you can actually go to the research literature and where financial theory um, is intertwined with uh, an otherwise very practical topic in finance, risk management. It is quite easy to show that risk management is quite similar to capital structure theory. What is the most famous theorem in capital structure theory? We should know that. What is the, the most famous result in capital, capital structure theory in corporate finance? Yeah? Yeah, Modigliani-Miller. The Modigliani-Miller theorem that states what? In a perfect capital market, capital structure is irrelevant for the value of the firm. Meaning that if you open a company, if you open a if you open a startup, and you have to decide whether you want to operate with 50% equity, 60% equity, or just 10% equity, and 90% debt. Eigenkapital, Fremdkapital. In a perfect capital market, you don't have to care. For the value of the firm, it doesn't matter whether you use high leverage or low leverage, whether you have 90% debt or 10% or 50% debt. It's sometimes also referred as the pizza pie chart theorem because it means that if you have a look at two companies and the one looks like this equity and debt and the other one looks uh, uh, looks like this equity and debt the distinction and the difference in equity and debt the difference in capital structure should not increase or decrease the size of the pizza that's the basic result of the modigliani miller theorem in a capital market perfect capital market very theoretical, still quite current. And then, obviously, you need to think about why do firms care about capital structure in reality? Well, because we don't have a perfect capital market. We have what we, we refer to as financial frictions and market frictions, friktionen, meaning that something is not perfect. A friction is always something that is that makes a market imperfect. And what are these frictions that cause problems? Taxes, transaction costs, irrational behavior of investors, incomplete information, the, the archetypical um, market frictions and financial frictions here. And for the Modigliani-Miller theorem, a famous, a very, or the, the, I guess one of the most central frictions that caused the theorem to come down and for capital structure to be relevant again is what? Which friction causes debt to have an advantage over equity? Yeah? Taxes. The tax deductibility or the, yeah, the tax deductibility of interest payments. Very simple example. The shoe store opens up it uses half a million euros in equity and half a million euros in debt. It makes a profit. Now what happens? The returns on equity are paid out to investors or not. The interest rate it has to pay on the debt is paid to the bank, but the interest rate payments can be deducted from the profits and you don't have to pay taxes on your interest rate payments. So there is what we call a tax shield of debt. Debt has a tax advantage over equity because you can deduct your interest rate payments from your profits for debt but not equity. And this makes debt more attractive than equity. 
and firms will use a higher leverage on average. So, and with risk management, you can show basically the same. You can compare two companies, one without risk management, one with risk management, and an investor can now choose, should I buy a share in the company with risk management or in the share without risk management? In a perfect capital market, assuming that you have no transactions, no taxes, and so on, an investor looking for a certain risk return profile could do just what? If I'm a risk-friendly investor, I will just say, I will put all my money into the risky company without risk management. If I'm interested in less risk, I will buy five shares from the risky company and 20 shares of the company with risk management. So I, just like with the debt and equity uh, uh, story in capital structure theory, I can combine my risk return profile by picking the stocks and uh, allotting the investment to the risky and less risky firm. So again, the pizza shouldn't get any bigger, any bigger um, if we engage in risk management or not. And just with, as with capital structure theory, you can again show that financial frictions, market frictions, taxes, and so on, market imperfections make risk management attractive for some companies, for some others not. What are those advantages? I can show you one. And if you're interest in, interested in this, look up the early works of René Sturz at Ohio State University. <laughs> He's famous for being the first to come up with Smith, Smith and Sturz. Uh, he and his co-author were the first to come up in the 80s with the idea that risk management just works exactly in theory like capital structure theory. And I give you a very simple example how theoretically you can show that yes, it makes sense to do risk management. Yeah. This is Modigliani Miller. We've seen this. Here I have some space to draw a plot. Assume we have two situations. We can lose all our money and we are here, or we can make one million dollars and we are here. Now, those two situations we have. We can lose everything or we can make a million euros. How much do we have to pay taxes on this? Here, nothing. And here, let's assume we have to pay this in taxes. Now, next idea is, what would happen if we would do risk management? Let's assume this is 0 0.5 probability and this is 0 0.5 probability. Now, let's assume we do risk management. We do not have the situation hop or top in German, uh, get everything or lose everything. We would say that we can also make half a million for sure, with no risk at all. So in expectation, we would pay this in Texas. Okay. Same old, same old with a linear function, no problem. It doesn't matter. If we have, if we lose everything, we pay zero taxes. If we earn, let's say, a million euros, let's say we pay 10%, so in expectation, this would be our tax payment. With a linear tax function, it doesn't matter if we have zero and one million or if we have 500,000. The tax payment would be the same, but what happens now? In most tax systems, we don't have a linear tax function, but we have a convex tax function.
meaning that if we do risk management and we earn half a million, we will only pay this in taxes with risk management. And this here, this difference, This is the tax advantage of hedging. Instead of having zero and one million and paying a lot of taxes or no taxes at all, you could simply hedge your risk. You will only earn $500,000 per sure, for sure, but with a context, uh, convex tax function, your expected tax payment will be much lower than the expected tax payment than in the case without risk management. Nice theory doesn't work in practice. Firms do not engage in risk management for tax reasons, for, but for other reasons. But this is a very simple idea how you can show that a market imperfection, taxes, immediately lets the theory based on Modigliani, Miller crumble down for risk management as well. By the way, for those people uh, that are a little bit more versed in the German tax system, what argument is this? We, everyone knows this. The same argument in personal income tax. This is Ehegattensplitting. Instead of, yeah, that's, that's the, the, the simple system in German personal income tax that you can do two tax uh, reports uh, and tax statements, income statements, if you are married for two persons, or you can just do a combined one. And the advantage, which we in German refer to as splitting Vorteil, das Ehegatten splitting, it's the same argument. Instead of having a very low and a very high income and doing two tax statements, tax return, you can just combine it and tax the average times two. And because also in German income tax, we have a convex tax function, this advantage is the same as in this argument, right? Okay. Now, there are other market imperfections that can be named. Uh, for example, yeah, I, I've talked about this. It's called homemade risk management, buying shares of a risky and a non-risky company. That's just like homemade leverage in the Modigliani-Miller model. But here, it's homemade risk management. So theoretically, in a perfect capital market, no, risk management doesn't add value. But with market imperfections, yes, you can show that risk management makes sense. Texas is one. Here's a famous quote from, from the Stoltz, from a Stoltz book, actually. In the long run, the argument goes, risk management cannot create wealth because it does not increase the company's expected cash flows. It just smooths out the ups and downs in cash flows, just like we've seen in the previous example. But as long as soon as market imperfections come into play, well, even theoretically, you can show risk management makes sense. What frictions are there in addition to taxes? Hedging cannot take place at equal cost. The two alternatives, zero and one million or 500,000, this hedging comes at a price. You have transaction costs, one problem. Measures of risk management can lower the probability of the firm's insolvency. A famous assumption in this view is that you can operate your company even up to this point where you are immediately close to bankruptcy. However, as you are closing in on your default barrier, as you are closing in at, to the point where you are bankrupt, you will start to lose customers, you will lose business, you will lose employees, they will... They will they will uh, go to other competitors. And you will have to start hiring uh, bankruptcy lawyers. So the direct and indirect costs of default, the insolvency costs, they will increase. And this is why a company will not be indifferent to the question whether it's far from its default barrier or it's very close to its default barrier. But at some point it will realize, okay, the water is closing in on my neck. I now have to start more to think about more about risk management. So insolvency costs play a, a huge role. 
and taxes with a convex tax function. We've seen this. Agency costs between equity and debt capital providers might lead to a situation in which a firm does not engage in investment projects. Could also happen. Stakeholders might force you to engage in risk management. Best example, regulators. Risk management for a bank is not just important for the bank itself, but it's important for financial stability, for the whole economy. That is why supervisors will step in and say, well, you have to engage in risk management. Stakeholders' views. Big non-diversified shareholders are certainly interested in company-specific risks, and so on, and so on. So you have a lot of reasons, theoretically, why it makes sense to engage in risk management. But please know that this, even though risk management is done in practice, we do have a theory in finance to show and to explain why firms do this. And do you know which companies were the first to be looked at in empirical research? Not banks, not insurance companies, but gold mining companies. Gold mining companies are not forced to engage in risk management. No one, no supervisor cares about a gold mining company, but they engage, they have engaged heavily in risk management. Why? They need to hedge currency risk and gold price risk. And they only do it by the use of financial derivatives. So it's a very simple type of risk management. And if you look at the empirical papers in the research literature uh, from the 80s and 90s, they look at gold mining companies because it's a very good laboratory to show that, yes, e if a bank could be just forced by regulators for several reasons, but it's very interesting to see that gold mining companies also engage in risk management. And the last example, before I stop now, uh, and you can see some results here on this slide, um, the last example I want to give you, and this is also one of the topics uh, for a bachelor's or master's thesis, if you're interested, right now in my chair, central banks do the same. And central banks also engage in risk management. Bundesbank and ECB engage heavily in risk management. Do you know why? One, one of the reasons why they engage in risk management, obviously they always have operational risk. They need to care about the security of the notes, of the bank notes. So security is an issue, but also what, what are they doing? At least Bundesbank has bought so many corporate bonds and government bonds as part of the quantitative easing monetary policy of the European Central Bank. They're sitting on a huge pile of financial securities and they need to monitor and manage the risk of these assets losing in value. That's why they engage in risk management. And if you have a look at those market imperfections and the reasons why firms should engage in risk management, actually it's quite easy to see that none of these theories apply. Central banks don't pay taxes. They don't care about leverage. They can just print money. They cannot default. Um, their managers are not paid out in options. So it's not variable compensation. They don't care about shareholder value, more or less, just write state, perhaps stakeholder value. Uh, so that's quite interesting. So the theory and the, 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 the jury is still out uh, for some questions why firms or some institutions engage in risk management. But for banks, it's mainly due to financial stability and supervision. And for some other companies, it might be that they are fearing the insolvency costs. Yeah, but this is the theory of risk management. Okay. Do you have any questions? Doesn't seem to be the case. Then thank you for your attention and see you next week. Thank you.